Everyone is anxious to talk this morning. We like that. We're glad that you're here. We are in week number six of our study, Rooted in Christ, taking us through the books of Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. And we're talking about the importance of a relationship with Christ being rooted in Christ. We took last week off because of our special series of lessons, but we're glad to be back in this and we're coming into a very practical very relevant everyday section of scripture. So we're glad that you've joined us. We'll be in the middle of Colossians 3 in just a moment. Before we begin, if you will bow with me, let's start off our time together with a word of prayer this morning. Our Father who is in heaven, we bow before you and we express to you our very great thanksgiving for this opportunity to address you as our Father as the one who so richly and abundantly provides for us. We thank you for our physical blessings, but Father, thank you above all for the spiritual blessings that are freely available to us in Jesus Christ. Father, help us in this life to be good stewards. Help us to live with perspective. Help us to recognize the immeasurable treasures that are available in Christ. Help us to deeply root ourselves in Christ and allow all of the aspects of our beings to be affected by our relationship with Him and with you. Thank you for this opportunity. We pray that you would be with us throughout this day as we worship and serve you. It is through Jesus that we pray. Amen. Colossians chapter 3 is where we're going to be starting in just a moment. I want to take just a minute or two to remind us of the basic flow of Colossians. It's important the way that Paul builds his case. He doesn't start out in Colossians chapter 1 talking about husbands and wives and fathers and masters and, and things like that. He lays for us a rich deep foundation that we need to appreciate uh, before we get to that very practical area. He began by pointing us to the preeminent Christ. He wants us to be in awe of the Christ in chapter 1. Then he turns his attention in the latter verses of chapter 1 to us. Here is Christ. Uh, the one who is above all and perfect. And then here is you and here is me. We were alienated. We were hostile in mind. We were doing evil deeds. But through the work of this preeminent Christ, we can be reconciled by His death to live holy and blameless lives as living sacrifices to Him. But in order to do that, we must continue in the faith. We must continue stable. We must continue steadfast. We must not shift away from the hope of the gospel. In layman's terms, we must be deeply rooted so that whatever storms come along, we are not blown away from the foundation of Christ. In Colossians 1 and in Colossians 2, he talks about the mystery of reconciliation and how in Christ there are great riches and treasures found. Therefore, it is kind of the hinge beginning in chapter 3 and verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ. He has outlined for us in chapter 2 what it means to die with Christ, to put ourselves to death and be buried and raised to walk in newness of life. And now this is how that translates into practical everyday Monday morning life, okay? This is what we need to hear appreciating that rich foundation. If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Set your minds on things above. He reminds us, you've died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Make Christ your life. 
Live as if you know and believe He is coming again and that you will also appear with Him in glory. The last time we got together, we talked about, practically speaking, things that must be put to death because on account of these things, the wrath of, of God is coming. Put all of these things away. You, you've put off the old self. Don't allow that old self to come back from the grave. And now, being of Christ every day, everywhere, is about more than simply abstaining from what is evil. It is about actively involving myself in what is good. Putting on as those who are chosen and holy and beloved the, these Christ-like characteristics and love that binds everything together. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Whatever you do, Colossians 3.17 do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, He has laid a great spiritual foundation for us. This is who God is. This is who you are. This is what God wants. And then He begins showing us in everyday practical detail how that's going to translate into our lives. In verse 18, he gets even closer now down to ground level, down to where we are, and he addresses several different groups or, 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 or areas of influence or, or areas of service. First of all, in Colossians 3 and verse 18, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. And do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. Masters, Treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, very often we'll break those down and we'll spend 30, 40 minutes just on one of them. Obviously, we don't have the time to do that. We're trying to appreciate the big picture of Colossians, the, the major flow, the, the, the train of thought that, that Paul is developing, really this is still flowing off of Colossians 3 and verse 1, right? If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. And he's getting lower and lower and lower down to ground level where people live and showing us what that means. You have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. You set your mind on things above. And those of you in these specific people groups, this is what you need to remember. This is what it looks like to have your mind set on things above. First of all, to wives. Why out of all of the things he could say to wives in connection with set your mind on things above? Seek the things that are above where Christ is. Why out of all the things he could say to wives, does he tell them, submit to your husbands? What is that? And why does he describe it as fitting in the Lord? Alan, go ahead. Uh, you know, for, for an army or for a military, to, for it to accomplish its task, it must be a fighting force. Okay. One to serve a purpose. For us, for every unit, for every person in the family, husband, wife, and children, there has to be a, uh, a commander. Okay. And also in the church. Okay. okay. We all have.
have a role? For it to work, that has to be done. Okay. okay. I think that's a great point. We all have a role. We all have a, a place to fill in the kingdom of God. And there must be, anytime we're talking about multiple personalities, there must be a, a a standard of authority and a chain of authority, if you will. It is the same Apostle Paul who told us back in 1 Corinthians that God is the, the Father is the head of the Son. God is the head of Christ and Christ is the head of man and man is the head of woman. We, we've got a, a clearly defined creative order that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of, of Eden. Jason, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, that we are called brides of Christ and we have a relationship. Since you were saying there's over here, there's a chain. Okay. Okay. It is a, a, as old as it's not good that man should be alone. Right? Those are God's words all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. And so he created a helper suitable for him. Uh, she wasn't inferior to him. She wasn't uh, not as intelligent as him or, or, or things like that. She was a helper suitable for him. Zippy, go ahead. One of those things too, even though there is that hierarchy, mm -hmm. it becomes an incumbent on us as husbands and fathers to we understand the fact that we're the head of the household but it, it's also that we have to inspire those to follow us as Christ inspires us Absolutely. and follow Him. Be the kind of person you, you be the man you be the husband the father that God is calling you to be and it's funny how things just begin to work Right. The hard part. I mean, he put us there. It's like it's like the military. You know, you, you're going to do this because I have a rank, and you're just going to do this. But if you do it right, you don't have you don't have to pull rank on them. They'll just do it. David, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, he, uh, you know, if everyone fulfilled their roles as as he has right there, especially in the family, that you would have a happy home. Uh, in the end, and so when things aren't happy, then one of those things is, is, is a problem. Absolutely. And, and and I think he, you know, when he says, "Wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives, children obey your parents," I think that's because there's a tendency not to do it. Right. And you know, even going back to the Garden of Eden, perhaps very beginning of time, that this this is God's designed origin or order. Of things and t today our society has got it really mixed up, right? right? And, and we, we we see the results, and uh, so if we fill our roles, you know, we should end up with a happy home. We need to understand, obviously, God, uh, Paul himself roots these kinds of instructions over and over and over again in creation. Uh, that, that goes beyond geography. That, well, uh, you, you know, women in Colossae, this is the way that you need to live. Women in, in Judea, maybe it's a little bit different. No, it goes beyond geography. It's not women of the first century, you live this way. Women of the 10th century, you live this way. Women of the 21st century, you live this way. No, he goes beyond geography, beyond time, beyond culture. And he roots these things, as Dave has brought up, in creation. This is the way God designed it to be in Eden. In that state of perfection, right? And, and when people live like that, when this is the way a household and relationships are, are, are interacting with one another, God's way works, right? When we give in to our tendencies to disregard God's way and strike out on our own path and just do our own thing, things begin to, to break down. Nancy, did you have your hand raised? Go ahead. Well, this could apply to husbands or wives. We still have to remember something you mentioned in a sermon several weeks ago about uh, our husbands are not perfect. We've got to remember to cut them a little <coughs> flack once in a while. But it's good to keep in your mind because our rock is God, right. not our husbands. But it's easy. It's good to think, uh-uh, maybe he did something. Ah, and I, well, that's right. He's not perfect, just like I'm not perfect. 
Absolutely. Hard to believe, but not for me either. <laughs> the, primary, the primary relationship is with the Lord. He's going to bring that up over and over again. He, he did it in the latter part of verse 18. As is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, verse 19, you love your wives and do not be harsh with them. What is this kind of love? And why does he particularly remind husbands, don't be harsh with your wives? Don't be a dictator. Okay. Back to, to many of the things that have already been said, right? This is not some sort of a dictatorial relationship, right? This is a self-sacrificing relationship. Ephesians 5 bears that out much, much more as well. I think that's a, a great point. Any other things as to... Eric, go ahead. Well, the idea, of course, you know, as, as men who, who work outside of the home... Um, you know, in business dealings, you know, a lot of times there, there's a harsh mindset. You know, you're trying to uh, gain advantage over another person, whether it's for your own growth, uh, company's growth, or whatever. And so, so we as men live in a society and live in a culture where we do that for where that, that's a lot of times the need for work. And so you have to break break away from your tendency and, and say, no, this isn't how we treat work mind has to be set on higher things, right? Going back to Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Husbands, you be like Christ was and is with the church, laying down his life for the church, giving himself for her, esteeming the interests of each other as uh, higher than our own. In Ephesians 5, it's under the umbrella of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ and then breaking it down into the individual people groups. Much the same kind of thing here. If you've been raised with Christ, if He is your life, now you live as if He is your life. You fill the role God is calling you to fill. Children, you obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. There is a built-in, God-designed role of submission and obedience for children to, to fill, right? That involves this the natural outpouring of having set my mind on things above. Fathers, verse 21, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. How can fathers very easily provoke their children? Hello? By not listening to them? By not listening. Again, Damn their problems. Yeah. This is not a dictatorial kind of relationship. This is not a master slave sort of relationship. Zippy? One of the biggest things that I sometimes fall into is the fact that I sometimes forget what the young can never know what it is like to be old. Okay? <laughs> but the thing is is that we seem to forget what it was like to be young. Absolutely. And when you start admonishing them as though they were mature enough to really understand what you're trying to say, sometimes you push them away more than anything. Absolutely. And I gotta stop and pull back a second and remember the fact, hey, you know, Alex is only fifteen years old or Katrina's only eleven. You know, that's that's the whole thing right there, is to be sympathetic to the situation right then and there. Absolutely. If if the standard isn't clear, if the standard is shifting where sometimes this applies but sometimes it doesn't, or do as I say and not as I do. Very, very easy to provoke your children the way he is warning us against. John? No, go ahead. Well, from a punitive sense, we see how Christ dealt with uh, situations during his life here upon this earth. And he, he always acted in a sense of love. Absolutely. And even when he was dealing with Sadducees and, and Pharisees and the like, that he, he be harsh in a sense, but he never went beyond what was necessary to make clear who stood where. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. What should we make of verses 22 and on? Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. 
not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive your inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. He's saying the same thing over and over again in different ways, isn't he? For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Are there some principles there that we can take and apply even to our own day and age? Grace, go ahead. But the employee versus employer today. In many ways, it's the, much the same kind of thing, right? Those who are employees and those who are employers. How, how first of all, to employees, how do these principles need to translate into life tomorrow morning as many of us go out into the workplace? What do we need to remember from Colossians chapter 3? As employees, they ultimately were working for the Lord. Okay. And so, I mean, if you just keep keep that in mind, then you know uh, we're we're not going to you know uh, slack off when the boss isn't looking, or uh, you know try to try to be men pleasers. Yeah. Day, you know, and, and, and uh, we're we're going to work hard. Not by way of I service. It's not all that hard to imagine what that is, right? I'm working really, really, really hard when the boss is looking. And then when the boss isn't looking, I'm taking it really, really, really easy. I'm going to do my best to be a people pleaser where, uh, you know, whatever I can do to get a leg up and, and, and just continue to climb the ladder. If I've got to step on people along the way, that's fine. If I've got to compromise my morals or my integrity, that's fine. My highest aim is to please other people. The Spirit of God through Paul says, don't be like that. You be a man or a woman of integrity, whatever the situation. You work hard as if you are working for the Lord Himself. Because the truth is, you really are. It goes back to Colossians chapter 1, right? He is the one who is preeminent over all things. And it's amazing if we go out into society and we live and, and we work like this and in our homes we live and we adopt these attitudes as those in positions of authority with others. If we're going to work to treat them justly and fairly. This is all about, listen, this is what it looks like to live with God at the center of your mind. On the throne of your heart. This is what happens when minds are set on things above. And guess what? It works. All of these problems and these strifes and, and, and jealousy and selfish ambition and rivalries and deceit and lying and all of these things that we could throw into the messy pot of humanity that we're going to see this week those things begin to disappear when we take God seriously at His Word and apply what He's telling us to everyday life. Alan, what were you going to say? In Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of the great practical lens through which we can appreciate what he's telling us in Romans 12, right? This is what the mindset of that living sacrifice really is. You've died. So if we walk according to those of this world, of this world mm -hmm. we already get what he did with Satan. But if we don't, Walk toward God. It will be Absolutely. Absolutely. He, he wraps up this instructive section of the letter uh, with a couple of rapid fire admonitions. This is very much like Paul at the end of letters, at the very end, more often than not, he'll have some very personal notes. We'll 
cover some of those and get into the book of Philemon, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. But a lot of times before he does that, it's like a bulleted list of little short phrases. Don't forget this. Do this. R remember this. Be this kind of person. This is what it looks like in Colossians. Colossians 4 and verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the Word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Some of our English translations render that redeeming the time, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Practically speaking, Monday morning kinds of terms. What does it mean to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving? What's that mean? What does that look like? What do we need to take away from this into everyday life this week? Phil, go ahead. I was just thinking, I find myself to make this what I think Paul talking about. Throughout the day, I'll find myself talking to the Lord. Kind of, it just kind of happens. Yeah. And you're always thinking, I have those things in mind. Just an everyday communion with God. Walking with God through the day. That involves communicating with Him, right? Dave, do you have your hand raised? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, you know, he, he links Thanksgiving to prayer. And, you know, if we just think about the things we have every day and, and Think about what the Lord's done for us, and I mean, how can we not pray to, to God and, and thank Him? How yeah. can we not spend time talking to Him? I mean, it, they're they're very much like. Yeah. yeah, odds are we all know what it's like to have sacrificed or to have given to to uh, provided something for someone else, and for them to take and take and take and never take the time to express their thanks. How does that make you feel? Not good, right? More often than not. Uh, that's immature, right? That's something that we try and help our children uh, learn. Th this, is, this is proper. This is good. And it, it, it's rude and self-centered to take and take and take and never express from the heart Thanksgiving for what you've got. Paul reminds us, primary way you give thanks to God, talk to Him in prayer. Don't, don't just live with this mindset, well, He knows. Hey, you know, she knows I appreciate it. Hey, he, he knows how much I uh, uh, appreciate everything that He's done. Paul says, don't be like that with God. Nancy? Yes, if you want to feel close to the Lord, you have to talk with Him just like... Friends and family. The more you converse with them or see them, the closer you feel. And same with the Lord. Yeah. If you talk to him once a week, you're not really very close to him. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Doesn't work in marriage, does it? By any means. By any means. And Jason reminded us of our, our relationship with Christ. What does Paul teach us about prayer with this very personal request? in verses 3 and 4. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the Word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. It's indirect. It's kind of below the surface. But what do we learn about prayer from that request of Paul? It's powerful, right? I mean, it really has an impact. This is not some sort of a psychological thing where, you know, I, I try to, to come up with words in my mind to somehow express, but really it's just all right here and I'm kind of 
psyching myself out kind of thing. Not at all. Paul truly believes there is power behind prayer. Prayer can change things. Prayer can alter circumstances. Prayer can have an impact on the everyday real life world around us. Verse 5, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Think about your life, right? Think about your influence. Are, are you functioning as the salt of the earth and the light of the world? Make the best use of your time. This is a, a preeminently practical section of Scripture, right? This is everyday life. Listen, you only have a certain amount of time. We remember He told us, He reminds us in Colossians 1, He reminds us again in Colossians 2, the Lord is coming again. The wrath of God is coming against all sorts of unrighteousness. Don't waste the time God has given you. Don't waste your life. Let's live with that mindset this week. Let's not waste today. Let's not waste what God is providing us this week, making the best use of the time. In verse 6, he turns to our, our mouth, our, our language, our speech. Let your speech always be gracious. Somebody give me a word or a phrase that you think of when you think of gracious. Let your speech always be gracious. It's the very opposite of self-centered, right? The, the very opposite of what's rude, uh, of what's clamoring, uh, of what's filled with jealousy and selfish ambition. It, it has to do with putting others ahead of myself, Dave. And I, I think it's still linked to, you know, uh, taking advantage of those opportunities because, Absolutely. Uh, you know, what comes out of our mouth to try to encourage people or, or we see someone uh, that, you know, wants to talk or, you know, we're, we're gracious and kind and, we, we, and it's because our mindset is set on things. Yeah. Yeah. We speak the truth but we speak the truth in love. It doesn't just matter what we say, but how we say it is one of the, the, the good ways maybe of summarizing the whole thing. Michelle, very quickly, go ahead. I think of, um, I don't know Spanish, gracias. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. Very close to. A gracious hostess is someone that's welcoming and trying to uh, supply amenities. Yeah. Yeah. So, someone who is willing to put themselves out for the good of other people. All of this has to do with we've been raised with Christ. We've died. Now our life is hidden with Christ in God. This is what it looks like to live that way. Thank you very much for being here. If you do not have material for next Sunday morning, that's either on the back of today's material or it's also available on the visitor's table in the foyer. Thank you for being here.